Welcome back to the big issue uh, discussing the matter of the acquisition of uh, loans for members of parliament to purchase vehicles. Uh, there's been public outrage about it, uh, saying that MPs are not reading their room considering the harsh economic difficulties the country is facing. But it's also brought about conversation about the expenditure in the public sector just generally, and uh, people are worried by how sustainable it is. If you listen to the first part of the show, you'd have heard uh, Dr. Kojo Pupunyasante, who is the Director of Advocacy and Policy at CDD Ghana, make that particular point. Franklin Kujo of Imani Africa has also made that point. And I'm in studio with uh, two former members of Parliament, George Lowe from North Dai, and then Alexander Aban, former member of Parliament for uh, Gomua West. There's a second part of the conversation as well, which has to do with how spouses of the President and uh, Vice President got in there we'll go for there. this discussion. We will have that part <laughs> as well before we end up in Idra to wrap up the show. So keep your messages coming on zero five four nine nine eight six nine nine six and zero five five zero five eight five eight three two. And I'm about you making a point. Yes, thank you. Um, so what I was saying was that because in the case of Parliament, it's an aggregation of so many people. Mm -hmm. People are looking at the global figure that is going to be used for them. Mm -hmm. Oh, $28 million, right? Now, if we should decide to go to all the ministries and count all the chief directors who are also receiving V8 and saloon cars for their work. So in the various ministries, we have the minister himself. If he has a deputy, the deputy the chief director, all these people are using V8 and saloon cars. Put all of them together and you see that they are even more than the 275. But I have said that because of the historical resentment we have that, oh, parliament is the weakest link, they don't do anything, so why should we pay them this and all that? People put value mm -hmm. on the work of a chief director more than that of the, uh, of the MP. And one of the reasons is this. Yes, they think that as for the chief director, as for the judge, it is through his industry, through his work. And it's a rank. Through, you see, so he's gone through the system and uh, he has graduated to that point. So he is deserving. For the MP, we saw you. I mean, just last year, we saw you in some rickety car. Mm -hmm. You came to us. We have made you who you are. So we don't see why that uh, we should give you uh, the, 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 that, that car. Right? But it appears to me that one of the reasons also is that when we go before the people asking them for their mandate, the amount of money we spend even before we get to parliament you could have used that same money to even buy a car. Mm -hmm. So they think that you should, uh, I mean, you have already displayed enough, uh, maybe, wealth of your own. So why should you get our small car too? Why, why sh should the state also give you a car? Because you yourself, you were campaigning. Mm -hmm. You used so much money, right? The other thing is just thinking that, oh, you are paid, you my money. And when it comes to the issue of value that they talk about, it is because we have not been able to educate the people of Ghana, the work of parliament, the real work of parliament. And the media is part of it. Because the media people will come and ask you, since you became an MP, what have you done for your constituency? What should an MP do for his constituency? Just an advocacy role. That's all that he can do. But unfortunately, we think that they must even bring projects and all that. And so when you weigh the MP as against those things, and those things are lacking, MP don't hear she. So why should he be giving? Look, and then those who are talking about value, 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 value. The value that parliament will churn out depends on the kind of people that we vote them. We vote into, into, that, into that house. Mm -hmm. Right? We go to, uh, let's say, Constitutional Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee. And if very few of us are the people who would do the real work, 
and the rest are not doing anything. Who brought them? The kind of material that we ourselves take there. It's not the same Ghanaian people who, who, who put them there. Yeah, that would blame your political party. What, your what party conditions? system structures it in such a way that certain people are made available to be voted for. So don't blame the people. No, but what blame they, your political party. No, the, the people, these are some of the things that we, 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 we don't want to see. We don't want to, uh, or they don't want to hear. But that's the truth. The people are not looking at quality. They're looking at those who will come and give them from 2020, 2010, 10, 10 cities. Then it's so, are you saying then invariably it is the it's political happening. parties who are not looking at quality, but are looking at people who can it's, pay? No, it's, is that what you're saying? The problem is not political parties' problem. The problem is Ghana problem, and we must we, we must tackle it well. Well, <laughs> okay. Political continue. parties don't political parties come with sometimes very good material in themselves, mm. and then those who lose not because. Uh, 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 because the people think that, oh, this guy, oh, 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 why am I angry? Right? So these are, it's part of a, a, a whole, uh, a, 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 chunk, a chunk of problems that we must deal with. Mm. Because if we saw the work of parliament as being that of uh, making laws, uh, examining the executive and checking them and all those kind of things, we would not reduce politics or the business of parliament to attending funerals. And I have observed, especially from the seventh parliament, those who worked very, very well for parliament, most of them lost. Because on a weekend, when I will be in Kofodia, for instance, dealing with, dealing with uh, Companies Act, going through it and making sure that things are done well, somebody will be in my constituency saying, well, so we can require one back. We can and that becomes the measure for the quality of an MP. And so if those who have availed themselves mm -hmm. of these funerals and other things become the darling boys, darling girls of the constituents, and whether they can contribute meaningfully to the work of parliament or not, they get voted there, and they are not able to do anything. Who should, who should we blame about the quality and the value for money? That is part of it. So the process of getting uh, elected and all these things all will, will feed into this issue that we are talking about. But then the bigger question but, at the end is sustainability. And on that is a question that nobody seems willing to give an answer no, but, but, How see, long can see, we keep on doing this? There are those who say, see. if you push, you say advocacy. Hold on, let me ask this question. You say advocacy, and you can come in, uh, Mr. Lowe. You say advocacy is your main job. Advocates for better, advocates for better rules. Advocates for the real system. Give the government the kind of pressure required so that you can take the train from here to not die. So that you can also take a ferry or if something from here to go more west and be comfortable. You don't need a VAT to do that. It will cost the cost. Now, we see, I understand that, but it is not the VH of the MP that is uh, making maybe the uh, economy slow. No. I can assure you that if things were properly done, the economy is strong, and that, who cares if the MP is even uh, buying uh, 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 a VH? Who cares? In fact, in the U.S., who cares what kind of cars the congressmen and women are using? It is because we think that, oh, uh, this economy is so small. Why should we get uh, MPs the V8? Meanwhile, when the other branches of government are getting the same thing, nobody questions. So question it. Is that not why you are an MP? Question it. That's why people but, vote but, for but, you, to look out for the public see, first. See, see, see. If you think it's an undue expenditure, as former member, a member of parliament for not that, why not speak up see, and say... That is not the argument. The, the argument the is judiciary that... judiciary is no, wasting money. The, no, the argument, speak up. the argument here is that these people in parliament are not deserving. That is the argument. It's, no, not, the so argument much, is, it's not so much about, oh, it is a drain on... on, 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 on no, but the, 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 that the, is not the, the point That's not the focus. 
The but resentment, the, the resent, that's why I said that. But so your defense, then it cannot be a drain because if ours is a drain, then everybody's is a drain. That is your defense. But, but you see, in, in all this, you see, in all this, that's why I said that. Let's look at the global picture. Mm. We will not make progress if we narrow it down to MPs are getting a B vis a vis some other people. You see, I always say that, and he, say, Mr. Ban says it as the fourth estate of the realm. Right? Mm -hmm. We need a thorough conversation on how we realign our whole governance system. I believe, contrary to what people are saying, that we are more than enough in this country to go around and everybody will be happy, irrespective of whether you are giving MPs fly, private jets or not. Including the ordinary citizen? Yes. I'm saying that, yes. Okay. Everybody, if we react, if we react. And then, you see, the conversation should be, I, I know Mr. Aban will not even be happy about what I'm coming to say, but I'll say it anyway. The conversation is about if we are flying 15,000 per hour aircrafts and things like that. By the time they go and come, how many V8s have they bought? Think about it. You see, let's put things in proper perspective. And let's tell ourselves. You see, I'm happy you said things like the rail should work. I'm passionate about rail networks. You know, when I, whenever I land in any of the airports abroad, you know, that even the rail at the airport alone is fascinating. Mm -hmm. These are the things we should all be aspiring to. These are the things that our government should be talking about. These are the, people, these are the things that our people, these are the things that the media should gear its message towards. These are the things that NCC and others should be talking about. Look at the COVID time. I felt sad. NCC, COVID pandemic, we've gone for over $1 billion. And when they wanted vehicles, we loaned them vehicles and took them back. Mm. Have you tried doing an activity with NCC in the district before? They don't even have bicycles. And nobody saw it as it was wrong. If you want to resource somebody, is it not the NCC to be able to do work, to be able to do advocacy, to be able to bring all of us on board in terms of government policy and all those things? So let's have a national conversation about what roles everybody is supposed to play and what they need for those roles and what should be provided and what not should be provided. Why don't we have you lead the national conversation? That is why you are in parliament. It, it, it see, doesn't look see, like every time parliament wants everybody to see, have that conversation. So why are you paying, lead the why are you paying an NCC chief executive a, a, a commissioner and her commissioners? Why are you paying her? Must parliament leave their uh, 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 legislative role and go and do their role also? There's stretch. There are other uh, uh, organs mm -hmm. of government that are expected to live up to expectation. Let's provide them with what they need and let them do their work. It is only then that we can get results. Mm. Let me you see, see, I've always said to people that anytime I hear media praising government, I get angry. Because when you read your constitutional injunction properly, you are not supposed to be doing that. You are supposed to keep government on its toes. Not on its legs, it's those. You should keep working. But you are not doing any of those. It's always, oh, government has done this, uh, uh, this one, that, that, then you're clapping. And media is giving all praise. It is not your job. Your job is to keep government on its toes. Do the, your part, let everybody else do their part. And then Ghana will be better for it. If we are narrowing the conversation that one arm of government is getting vehicles, and so we are spending all our time talking about vehicles, whether it's a loan, whether it's not a loan, whether it doesn't take us anywhere. All right, let me let me take thoughts from uh, Dr. Asante and Franklin on the comments that you have and made. Tell and we can Franklin move to the... be very careful. You didn't say it to you. Franklin said what he was to say. Nothing can stop Franklin. And then we can <laughs> add the part about the emoluments for. Uh, spouses. presidential spouses. spouses. Yeah. Yes. Dr. Sanzi. Oh, thank you. I mean, I've been listening carefully to uh, your MPs uh, in the studio. Uh, I mean, I, I must say that, uh, you know, these were at least two of the hardworking ones that uh, I have worked with over the years. So, you know, I, I give much respect to them. Um, I, I'm just trying to get the conversation um, you know back on track because you know we these things we've been building up on these things I don't know how long this democratic arrangement this uh, institutional arrangement and, and, and the practices that we have attached to it would would survive you know but 
uh, from all indications, uh, we are not solving any problem. And this idea about, I mean, what I wanted to get from the MPs is, are they saying that the, the perks and the conditions of service that the, uh, in the other arms of government, they think that this is uh, adequate, is proper, it, it's, uh, it's consistent with, you know, uh, protecting the public past, the, pursuing the public interest. Are they happy with it? And therefore, if they get the same, then there's nothing wrong with it. Or they are saying that because it's already done for these arms of government, there's nothing wrong, they get in it. Because, you see, if it's the latter, then that is where the problem is. That every time, and I'll come to the spouse's issue, any time that everybody comes and, and sees a problem, and often the, the problem, they complain about it when they are outside of government. Instead of trying to address it, they rather would extend it or endorse it or regularize it. Now, if we keep doing that, then we never will solve that problem. So if the, the kinds of practices in the public service, and, we, and all of us, CDD, money, whatever, we talk about this all the time. Uh, executives going, they, 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 they take these cars at Peppercorn. Directors uh, buying cars, they probably would not even use it and just keep it, hoping that they can retire and take it away. You know, there's all kinds of things that we have complained about. So, as I said from the beginning, for me, it's not just about the MPs uh, uh, matter. Mm -hmm. This is across the, the entire public service. But, but what we are saying is that, I mean, we should be practical. We, we are not some, I mean, you know, when you talk about cost, you have to be really, you have to be practical about it. We cannot say that, you know, you know, giving uh, hundred thousand because it is the state that is still making that expenditure. So if you cap it at forty thousand, it has implications on the budget. If you cap it at hundred thousand, it has implications on the budget. And there's no reason why the state should be deciding that it will cap it at hundred thousand. A condition of service. If you take employment in the private sector, when you go and you're you are giving condition of service. At least I'm in a position where uh, I have to make those kinds of decisions. You are looking at things that will facilitate the work of that staff. So it's not like a, just a free freebie, a giveaway. Oh, you know, let's, this is this is what comes with it, and then we just give it. No, there are there are there are things that inform why you get certain benefits in the conditions of service. And so if you look at the MP's work. There's no way that in all cases you are justifying the kinds of uh, uh, rationale we are applying for giving up vehicles or because then it's distorted. The original, the original intention is distorted. And you cannot treat public money that, that way. It is just not acceptable because it cannot inure to the benefit of the public in any way. Oh. And, and I have to say that, of course, Kenya and Nigeria is never a best case uh, best practice is it's I mean it's 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 as offensive as you know if if you have to put it that way, it is re it's really a bad practice and therefore definitely we shouldn't be looking at those things, right? So for me, I think that we we have to be realistic about these things. If we just if with the problem is with the entire scheme as as I identify right from the beginning, then. The arrangement as it is, the, the proposal for the executive comes to parliament. When it comes to parliament, what does the community of the committee of the whole say about all of the things that the executive are getting? Why should judges be getting V8? Why should Council of State be getting V8? As you said, they probably are more in Accra than than you know MPs. So why should they be getting V8? And why should it why cannot it be a Prado? Why does it have to be a V8? Right? So all of those things, I think, why is it, why are MPs not questioning any of that? You approve and approve. And that's why people will say, you scratch my back, I scratch your back. Rather than 
interrogate it, do the oversight responsibility, which is what the Constitution in, uh, intended. But of course, it's become uh, 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 you approve, I approve. And that cannot be, that cannot benefit the public in any way. And it cannot be sustainable, particularly, as I said, the more and more of these officers that are retiring on their salaries, at some point, we will not be able to fund it. And it's going to create huge problems for us. So we have, parliamentarians have a responsibility. That's where they are there in parliament having to make these choices. That we need to really look at these, these processes again and find a more sustainable way of doing it. The, in many of the emoluments reports, there's been a proposal for some sort of a, 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 a committee, a more you know, a standing committee of some sort that we can review and make these proposals, you know, for everybody. And that covers all Article 171 office holders. Maybe that is needed, but nobody has implemented that, uh, you know, for, for, for a while. If you talk about, I mean, uh, Honorable Aban was talking about the underlying problems, and I talked about this, that we are not solving the underlying problem. So, it wouldn't be surprising that MPs will come and walk a bigger common fund because the, the, the monetization of politics will continue, the vote buying will continue, the people will be at your doors all the time if we don't elect MMDCs to make sure that the people can, you know, can go to those elected mayors and deal with their problems and they come to MPs. If we don't do that, if we don't do campaign financing, to remove or reduce the incentives that we have created in all this monetization, then we have the problem. So that is also within the purview of parliament. So every time we have a problem, instead of solving it, we, we just, uh, how do you say, democratize the problem for everybody so that we are all in the same boat and we are not resolving you know, our issues. Now, let me talk about the... the uh, the spouse is one. Yes, that's where we are getting you. So you can begin that conversation for me. So um, just a bit of background to that. We now have uh, the Member of Parliament for South Dai, Roxin Dafia Mekwo, and the Member of Parliament for Busa South, Clementa Park. They have jointly filed a suit at the Supreme Court to challenge the presidential spouse and monuments. We also have the Bruno Chair of the MPP, uh, Kwame Bafo Abronye. He has also filed a similar action at the Apex Court seeking to declare the presidential spouse emoluments as null and void. Now, this comes out of the Professor Yanti Amwabiru Committee report. And basically, uh, the numbers we are looking at, well, the president has 47,277 uh, CDs. Uh, Rebecca Kufuado, the first lady, 33,270. The vice president is on 39,397 and proposed for Samira Baumia is 32,800. 32. And this has also brought a whole different conversation on. Let me hear your thoughts on this, um, uh, Dr. Asante. And then I will read uh, former President John Mahama's explanation of the matter as he also understands it. So, um, when I, I read the, uh, the committee's report, and uh, if you, you follow the, the reference to this matter of um, uh, providing for former spouses of, of uh, presidents and former heads of states and vice presidents and so on. So they, they raised this matter that, yes, this came up at some point. Uh, and as part of some humanitarian decision, they, they felt that uh, uh, those spouses who are falling on hard times or former heads of state and so on, Need to, to be taken care of, and decided that they were going to take care of them through their monuments. First of all, that was, I think, illegal. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the um, the intention, you know, of of sort of uh, providing for former South spouses or heads of state, uh, because, um, yeah. You know, for whatever, nobody, I don't know what the circumstances were, but you know, that could have been done uh, differently. But then it indirectly tried to expand the scope and the ambit of Article 71 
office holders, and that was problematic. So this is a practice that continued. And then it, it was extended to sitting uh, presidents and vice presidents. So the illegality of that, I think, uh, is, is clearly uh, established. Now, the committee goes into this. And I'm expecting that the committee would come to a conclusion that, OK, this is the justification why we should do this, uh, you know, continue this practice. Because first ladies and second ladies, you know, serve some role, the this and that, and so on and so forth. And therefore, this is uh, their, their time have to be compensated. That was not provided. All he said was that we should continue this practice, but legalize it. And legalizing it was to legalize it through the emoluments process as part of the privileges of presidents and vice president. So I fault the committee because I think they could have done a better job in dealing with this matter rather than seeing something that was uh, not right or not done properly. And basically, in their own estimation, the way to address the problem was just to uh, add it to the monuments. And I think that's, that's wrong. Now, why is, why, is that a, why, is the, why is that issue a problem? First of all, the first lady and the second lady, they, these are not appointed officers or elected officers of any kind, right? We know that as a matter of fact that their office is, is financed by public money, even though we haven't declared that office as a public office which has to be audited, which has to be scrutinized by parliament and all of those things. So there are all kinds of things that we are doing to that office that really you expect that uh, if we want to do it rightly, you, you should properly designate that office as a public office of some sort, right? We haven't done those things. So this payment to this unelected and appointed this is not a public officer that you are giving a salary to it's suggested that you know the president can actually or the vice president or whoever can actually give a salary to their son or their daughter and this will be fine right it's not there's there's too much you know it's, it's not it's really a distortion of of uh, Article 71 is illegal, and I don't think that it, it has to be corrected immediately. If we agree that the the first lady and the vice, uh, for, uh, what's the second lady, there's a public of justice done in other places like the U.S. and so on. They they would you know they vote for a staff or for the but but they are public offices that will be audited. Those bodies or be audited and so on and so forth then that's fine. But the individual, unless you are, going to you are going to designate that person as a public officer, you cannot pay the person. That's why in, in the U.S., uh, uh, Dr. Joe Biden, it's, it's, she's gone back to work. All right? So the first ladies and the second ladies, they do provide ceremonial roles and all of those kinds of things and so on and so forth. But they are not people that are performing public public functions in, in the way that you they are public officers that are doing these things. If that is what we want, and you want to appoint a first lady and second lady as a public officer, then you do that. You do that through legislation. And then the office is properly designated as a public officer, then you you would apply all the rules that you know happen. If we don't care this issue, then within the emoluments framework, we will just keep through discretion, keep expanding and adding all kinds of things. And that adds to the problem. So for me, you know, I think that uh, what has been done is illegal. You cannot treat it as just privileges when you are paying salaries, right? They are dependents and all of those things. That, that's, that's all taken care of. That's fine. But when you are going to pay the person a salary who is not even a public officer and so on and so forth, that is wrong. That is not in the scope of 71. And you need to find other ways. But we, but that is why legislation is important. So it comes to parliament. We can debate the pros and cons of going down this path. 
And then we can all agree that, yes, it's a public office. This is what the functions of the first lady and second lady, they we, we will audit them, we will treat them, we will scrutinize them just like any public office, and then we can deal with that. Thank you, Dr. Asante. Uh, let me come in, just uh, touch on the letter for President Mahama wrote, and then I can talk to uh, Mr. Lo and... Uh, Honorable Aban, Mr. Aban, on this matter. So, uh, the I former really president. An analyze that later. Oh, okay. I'll help you. <laughs> and uh, Franklin Kuzo as well. You read it. Uh, will comment on this a bit later. So, uh, it's quite a lengthy letter. I'm just going to read bits and pieces of it. So he says that the issue of handling the issue of handling spouses of political office holders is not a new one. It has engaged the attention of all governments since the advent of the Fourth Republic. Now, according to him, the practice thus far has been that some expenses of the spouses of the president and vice president in carrying out their expected roles are funded by the office of the president. This includes fueling of vehicles, security, clerical staff, stationery, hosting of local and foreign guests, and all such expenditure. The distinction must be made, however, that this is separate from allowances payable to spouses of the president, vice presidents, former presidents, former vice presidents, and former heads of state. In the first government of the Fourth Republic, which is the Rawlings administration, some recommendations were made to provide allowances to the spouses of the president and vice president. And additionally, as a gesture of reconciling with our past, the spouses of former presidents and heads of state. Since this convention was established by the Rawlings administration, issues in respect of allowances of the spouses of the president and vice president and spouses of former presidents and heads of state have largely been handled administratively and provided for under the budget of the office of the president. This week, a raging issue that has generated passionate debate among Ghanaians, both on social media and in traditional media space, has been in respect of a report confirmed by governments that the spouses of President Anel Kufuado and Vice President Rata Mahmoud Baumia are to be placed on a monthly salary at the level of a cabinet minister. We are told that the seventh parliament of the Republic of Ghana, which was dissolved at midnight of January 6, 2021, approved the recommendation of the report of the Presidential Committee on Emoluments for Article 71 of his holders, chaired by Professor Yaa in Bidu. The news, particularly at this time of austerity, has generated some level of outrage among the populace. And I can understand the anger of those opposing the recommendations of the in Bidu Committee and the subsequent approval by Parliament. It should be made clear also that the recommendation in respect of Spouses in the Ntiamwa Bedu Committee report, which covers the seven year, which covers the years January 7, 2017 to January 6, 2021, is solely in respect of the spouses of President Kufuado and Vice President Baumia. The challenge, however, is that the spouses of the President and Vice President are not captured among Article 71 of his holders, and therefore there is no legal or constitutional basis for it. It should be noted that the recommended salaries for the spouses in the TMO Bidu report are captured as part of the emoluments of the president and the vice president. This seems like an attempt to sneak the first and second ladies into the Article 71 office holders group. This is clearly problematic. Indeed, the TMO Bidu committee really makes the case on page 51 of this report as follows. Quote, the committee knows that neither Article 71 nor any of the provisions in the Constitution bestows benefits on spouses of presidents and vice presidents. Similarly, no legislation mentions what the state should provide for spouses of presidents and vice presidents. The question then is, if the committee recognizes the above, and therefore appreciates that there can be no legal or constitutional basis for seeking to bestow any such benefits on the spouses of the president and vice president, why then did it proceed to provide for the payment of monthly salaries pegged at the level of a cabinet minister to both the first lady and wife of the vice president who served in the period 2017 to 2020, even if it was conveniently enveloped as part of the emoluments of the president and vice president? And why did parliament also approve, as has been reported, this recommendation without a review? Article 71 is an entrenched clause in the 1992 constitution, nothing short of a referendum can be used to amend or override that clause as per Article 290 of the Constitution. The committee and indeed the government cannot use a shortcut to circumvent well-laid-out constitutional rules. Furthermore, pegging their salaries at the level of a cabinet minister suggests that all conditions and benefits that come with the committee's recommendation for a cabinet minister will likely apply. This recommendation, therefore, is inappropriate and this approval, if true, is unfortunate. 
as earlier mentioned, it is a fact that over the years, successive governments have continued the convention of providing the offices of the first lady and second lady with allowances. The practice has included the payment of quarterly allowances in the, to the surviving spouses of former presidents, former vice presidents, and former heads of state, which practice has been appreciated by the beneficiaries as a token from the state. Anyhow, if government wishes to formalize these allowances, it must bring some form of enabling legislation to back these payments, noting that best practice in other democracies do not support payment of salaries to spouses of office holders. This debate also brings back to the former off repeated position that the recommendation for the establishment of an independent emoluments commission must be carried through. I believe that instead of trying to unconstitutionally enlarge the scope of Article 71 office holders for the purposes of determining emoluments, the government must, as a matter of urgency, set up the independent emoluments commission. To provide some background, the establishment of an independent emoluments commission was a recommendation of the Constitution Review Commission in 2011. It was endorsed in the government's white paper, and both the Edu Bando and Intia Mwabedu committees made a case for its urgent establishment. In fact, I am on record to have, to have championed this position. If this proposed independent emoluments committee is established, the commission will not only stop the practice of setting up a new emoluments committee every four years and coming up with varying recommendations, but will ensure that salary administration in Ghana is rationalized and equity is brought into the system. He then goes on to say that the times are dire and the economy is under severe stress. Any attempt to broaden the scope and for that matter turn the spouses of the president and vice president into permanent office holders in addition to the support provided to the offices would appear unreasonable. He then goes back into history and says, I recall that I entered the fourth Republican parliament in the same year as President Anel Kufado. As a young MP, I remember we debated an amendment to the Assets Declaration Law to expand its ambit. One of the groups targeted for addition were spouses of public office holders, including the president, vice president, ministers, among others. Leading those who vehemently opposed the inclusion of spouses was President Akufuado. I remember one of the main thrusts of his argument was that a spouse could not have known that their partner would end up in high office as at the time they got married. It would therefore be unfair to subject them to the hazards of an asset declaration regime. Have the chickens come home to roost? A spouse may not have known that their partner will end up in high office at the time of marriage. So would it not be unfair to bestow upon them salaries as part of their husband's emolument in office? Finally, it has also been indicated that the first and second ladies have been receiving allowances from 2017 to date. Should the government choose to ignore the cries of the citizen as seems to be the pattern of the day, steps must then be taken to ensure that the committee's recommendations are not retroactively applied leading to double payments signed on the Friday, July 9, 2021, uh, by the former president of Ghana, John Dramani Mahama. So he added his two cents to the topic as well. Mr. Lo, <laughs> you're happy with yours. What is wrong with this one? Well, <clears throat> I think that the major issue there is that these spouses not being part of Article 71 office holders. Mm -hmm. Steps not having properly been taken to include them. It goes without saying then that whatever is being done in that year, it's an illegality and must not be tolerated by anybody. And I think that the case speaks for itself. You see, let me give you just a little historical background. Mm. You will remember that at a point in our governance, uh, under President Rollins, we had unfortunate news that two of our former head of state's spouses. Yeah, that was Fulera. No, 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 not Fulera. There are two, even before Fulera's own also came up, were arrested for shoplifting in the UK. You remember? Yes. Uh huh. And then the Fulera issue where I remember at the point they didn't even have accommodation of their own. They had to be housed at the VRA bungalows and things like that. So the issue came up as to, look, this is becoming like a national disgrace. Where your former president or former head of state's wives are caught shoplifting because genuinely they are falling on very hard times. So remember that Madame Fatia, for instance, was invited. The house that was taken by the state was restored. And that's how come the children even came. You remember all yes. that? So this is what fed into all these proposals. When these proposals were made, 
Then uh, uh, President Kufu, when he came into office, also agreed that look, it looks like the proper thing to do that let's have some stipends being given Indeed. in support to our former head of state's wives, and it was extended to sitting head of state. You see, I have always said that even presidents, for cosmetic reasons, if I had the opportunity, president shouldn't even take salary. Because sincerely speaking, sincerely speaking, what does the president pay for? Tell me. When you become president of Ghana, having been duly sworn in, taking office, what do you pay for? Maybe you might go for a private dinner somewhere. You know, the president no, no, needs no, 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 no. Money. I mean, look, the president, when he's moving around, there is always a, a, a spendable impress. You know. Master, you know. Even as a minister, when you travel with ministers, they have a spendable impressed. You go and eat, they tell you, oh, no, 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 you'll be taken care of. So clearly he has nothing. But I agree that they should retire on their salary. That is where the problem, that is where the issue should be. Because they should not come and serve and go back into penal. So I'm saying that at that point, like President Mahama said, if your first lady's travels are taken care of, her lady is waiting, is being paid by the state. Her secretariat is being financed by the state. Her car is being uh, uh, fueled, fueled by, by the state. Uh, whatever her immediate expenses Stationary are. Stationary is paid yes, for. Yes, under the auspices of the office of the president. Of the president is paid for. Look, in 2017, Madam Rebecca Ekufuadu was so solely able to raise monies from the public organization for these uh, is it Kumasi children's uh, for the children's block or something. Epico. Yeah, yeah. She raised so much money. Goyal, VNPC, all of them were giving money for her foundation to do that kind of thing. So really, but that money is not hers. I'm saying that no, we are talking about the first. The first, the president has a duty to the wife, first and foremost. And Danlate answered that question for us long ago. Do you remember the famous saying that when they asked him what the first, they said, "What is the first lady? The first lady you are supposed to serve your husband." <laughs> you, who pays your wife's salary? Don't you cater for your home? Are you getting my point? I believe that today, if President Akufuado wants to eat kinky and sardine, you won't buy it. If there's none at home, a telephone call will be made and it will be provided. Right? His health is getting taken care of, his family, his household is taken care of. So what is it, really, 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 that we are now coming to bed in the state with salaries at the level of cabinet ministers? It's a no, no, no. It's a no, no, no. And albeit everybody is saying it is illegal. Mm. The framers of the constitution didn't envisage this kind of thing. You think so? Yes, they didn't. They would have put it there. And for me, my greatest worry though is that the committee itself recognized mm -hmm. and yet went ahead to, to recommend. Do I don't understand. If they recognize that, well, they are not part of Article 71 and no space. In it. So why did they go ahead to say that legalize the thing? When the, the, the Article 71, well, uh, Article 71 itself is an entrenched clause in the Constitution. It's so you know that you cannot even just walk to Parliament one day and, and that even a certificate of agency acts that it should be. It should be submitted to a referendum. So really, I don't know what went into the thinking of the committee to even make this proposal. But you see, I have a bigger problem. Which is? One. The argument is that Parliament passed it. Mm. My own checks have shown that indeed the issue was raised and some members of Parliament objected. That, that night? Yes, that, some members raised the issue and I remember very well, I, I, I'm told that Honorable Muntaka, for instance, kicked against it. But in the Parliament where at the time you had 169 and 106, I mean, they, they, I mean, it was not worth pushing argument. So. It, 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 it went through. But my question is, now when it got to the executive, didn't they see it? President Agufado himself is a lawyer by all standards. He should have known that this cannot hold. Mm. He should have known. I mean, nobody... Just, and let me give you a good example. You remember that in 2009, when such things were done, you remember some committee brought some report and uh, I think it was a Yamsin, it's my Yamsin committee. Professor Mills stopped some of the payments and cancelled some of the things out. So I thought that the president 
who has come to swear to us that he was going to protect the public press will be the number one person to say this is a non-starter. But to the extent to, to the extent that it's even gone and possibly even some payments have been received, then we are. I mean, then he hasn't lived up to his call. Mm, and, and we have put it straight, straightly at his doorsteps that he had also the opportunity to stop this. This will not have ended up at the Supreme Court as it looks like uh, it will uh, at the moment because we have also received indications that a few more cases will be filed on. Yeah, this yeah, yeah. Looks and like the, quite a people are willing. Yeah, to, yeah so I'm sure there will be a consolidated case of case somewhere. So many, yeah, and then, All right. But hold on for me. I just need to take a quick break yeah. and then we'll hear from Franklin and uh, Mr. Aban on this matter. we wrap this up and then we'll go to Ejra. Welcome to Solatec, the number one manufacturer of innovative products in power protection. The Solatec Ultima LCD UPS is a line interactive UPS with a unique LCD screen allowing you to monitor its performance and get the best from your electrical equipment. Monitor the battery level, input and output level, load level indicator and overload indicator on your LCD screen. It provides a solid reliable source of backup and has an inbuilt stabilizer which enables all computers and televisions to remain wholly protected. It comes in ranges of 650 VA to 2000 VA. Remember, stay original by Solatech. For more information, please visit www.solatechghana.com.gh. Solatech, the power to protect. It can be prostate, cervical, breast, endometrial, head and neck colorectal or any other cancer they have no place here why because sgmc cancer center treats all solid tumors no matter the stage of the disease we use advanced technology like radiotherapy brachytherapy and chemotherapy for our treatment locate us behind lakeside estate community 8 katamanso or call us today on 0201 409 403 or 0262 253-328 for inquiries and booking and your cancer burden will be a thing of the past. NAT, NAGRAT, ECG staff as well as their spouses and children below 18 years do not have to pay to receive treatment at SGMC. SGMC Cancer Center taking away the burden of cancer. What a picture! Oh, what a picture! 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 What a Get an HD Plus decoder from now till the 9th of August for just $89.99 Ghana CDs and enjoy three months free subscription. Enjoy all the excitement and life sports action in the HD Plus Air Bossu Fili Fili Promo. Promo lasts from 7 June to 9th August 2021. Visit hd-plus.com.gh or call 024 243 9872 for more info. What you you a Half a nose for good things. <laughs> Welcome back to the big issue. Uh, Anabola Ban, I'll hear from you. I'll hear from Franklin as well. Let me just take a couple of messages that have come through and then we will continue 
the conversation. Uh, from Citizen Francis, again, it says those who receive double salaries and those who sanction these payments are criticizing the payment of monthly allowances to the first and second ladies. Uh, hypocrisy and dishonesty uh, has engulfed them. I don't think they are criticizing the payment of monthly allowances. They are criticizing it being legalized as a monthly salary at the level of cabinet ministers. So Citizen Francis know what exactly the disagreement is about. Uh, poor Citizen says, we the youth already made up our mind and understand that getting into politics is to make money and better one's life. Be it car loans or spouse our salary, no amount of damage control explanations will change anything. Uh, this one says, so when we get a female president or, uh, or vice president whose spouse is a CEO of C, a bank or a mining firm, will we pay him a salary or allowance? I mean, how? This whole arrangement for spouses or presidents is sexist and parochially crafted for a retreating dictator and offer for purpose. It must be reviewed. Uh, Fred from Malam is on a very, very common tangent. He says the only time the minority and the majority agree is when there's a mutual benefit. Don't let us try to rationalize and justify this. It's four years. Four years as Gracia. Please, 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 please. He's not too happy this morning. Uh, Michael now from Shaman uh, Valko Flats says, Kofi, did I just hear one of your former MPs say MPs said that are uh, interest? I don't think so. I believe all the MPs have retired citizens in their constituencies who have had their pensions benefits withheld by governments for the past four years or more. And I've never heard any MP raise this issue on the floor of parliament. I've even put some amount of pressure on government to release those monies. People have died leaving those monies behind. Looks like Michael now has a particular issue with the pensions side of things and why. MPs is not. Michael, you should take on your MP on this matter. Elvis from Sakumono says, government is wasting too much money. We might as well take back the old SUVs and get them new ones. And also institute a rule that such vehicles need replacing after every eight years rather than after every four years. Uh, Albert, let's see. Uh, MPs Carlo wouldn't have been a subject for discussion but it is because over the years they have disappointed us just like government itself and they have not done the kind of job we expect them <coughs> to do. Uh, the fact that the government has done something wrong by spending so much on VH for the executive does not mean we should turn a blind eye and allow this to go on. So uh, these are some of the messages that have come through on the show via our WhatsApp uh, platform. I have a lot more on this matter uh, the salary approved for first lady and second lady is unfortunate on the part of those who have sworn to protect and defend the state against uh, without questioning its content this is very bad this is mr dean all the way in tamil how are you in tamil well anyone akwetia says assuming this emolument is accepted in favor of the presidential spouse can our uh, ailing economy hold if we have a president who has two wives uh, we should trash it to avoid our parliamentarians in, uh, in future demanding the same for their spouses in order to save the economy from shrinking. So keep the messages coming 0549986996, Mr. Aban says he holds a contrary opinion to all this. Why exactly do you agree that we should legalize this? Uh, thank you very much. You see, uh, there's some kind of confusion going on, especially the nomenclature adopted without necessarily uh, going into the constitution itself to find what kind of operational definition has been given to the word salary. Okay. Now, uh, I think that the former president's epistle, he makes some historical facts uh, which cannot be controverted. But at the same time, he tries to make huge political capital out of this. And that kind of, with all due respect, hypocrisy and dishonesty is what I want to uh, expose, right? He acknowledges that these ladies, the first and the second ladies, by reason, just by reason of their office, are engaged in a lot of advocacy work. And in his per first paragraph, I think, he enumerates a lot of them, right? So definitely, uh, just by reason of being spouses, we put that kind of burden on them to work as though they are public officials. We cannot, we cannot run away from that. 
And from that background, he seems to say that, oh, so it was reasonable mm -hmm. over the period to give them uh, some kind of money. And he chooses Not to money, use... Not money, but to facilitate those activities. Definitely, to give them money. No, it comes vehicles, security, stationery. Good. Those things are the, what they are giving. Administratively. Uh, exactly, to facilitate but, those things. But the point is that it's all expenditure, is that what it is? Yes. Of the public money. Yes. Which, to all intents and purposes, had not been budgeted for and had mm. not been approved by anybody, especially the representatives, representatives of the people. This is under the office of the president, though, so it would have been approved. By who? Yeah, when they bring their budget. When they bring, when their they budget. bring the budget, would you have a budget line mm -hmm. that this is for presidential spouse support? Miss No. You would not find something like that. So to that extent. You can find miscellaneous. To that good. So if it is couched within miscellaneous mm -hmm. and an office of that nature is created and all that, and you can just uh, smuggle it in and uh, smuggle it into miscellaneous, please, a time has come where we have to let people know that this is actually being funded. The offices of these, because they create offices with their secretariat, with ladies in waiting and all those kind of things, and they are paid. Mm -hmm. So over the years, over the years, that illegality, if I should put it that way, has been shrouded somehow and uh, subsumed into the operations of the office of the president. Mm -hmm. A decision comes that, okay, let's deal with former presidents, spouses, pay them something and all that. Regardless of whatever nomenclature that you give it, it's public money being expended on their activities. Though they are not public officers, strictly speaking. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, let us go to... I know that when you go to Article 71, they are not featured anywhere. Mm -hmm. They are not featured anywhere. The people who are featured, speaker, deputy speaker, members of parliament, chief justice and justice of the Superior Court of Judicature, auditor general, uh, chairman and deputy chairman of the electoral commission, uh, then commissioner for charge, uh, this assembly, common fund administrator, then we come to the chairman, vice chairman, and other members of national council for higher education. I know we call it tertiary education. Mm -hmm. We have public services commission, we have national media commission, lands commission, the National Commission for Civic Education. I intentionally mentioned all these things so that it doesn't look like it is just the MPs and, let's say, the president. Because every time they are talking about scratch your back and scratch your back, I don't know these people are part of the uh, equation in determining it. No, they are not. Then, what I want us to even talk about is uh, Article 71, Clause 3. And with your permission, let me read it. For the purposes of this article, and except as otherwise provided in this constitution, salaries, mm -hmm. unquote, uh, I mean, quote, unquote, include, include allowances, allowances, facilities, mm -hmm. and privileges and retiring benefits yes. or awards. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the common street understanding of salary is that you work and at the end of the month, you get there something. Is, yes, there is some uh, payment that is given to you. So, uh, People will say that, ah, we have not employed the first and second ladies. Mm. So why should we give them salary in the thinking or the acceptation that we have of that word? But here, it is loose. It it, it's expansive, and it includes some all other uh, payments. So to that extent, from the Rollins time when they started these payments, they had been receiving salaries. No. I disagree with that interpretation. No, you, you, you let me finish. Yes, finish. After that, you, you, yes, you, you, can, you, can, you can deal with me on uh, uh, your yes. interpretation, yes. right? Yes. That's why I say that yes. salary includes allowances, mm -hmm. facilities. Mm -hmm. So all those allowances and facilities mm -hmm. uh, that were being given to those mm -hmm. officers of the first lady and second lady, mm -hmm. to my mind, mm -hmm. can be subsumed in the word salaries here as explained or as uh, 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 defined. By the constitution itself. No. Yes, you hold your opinion. That's yes. why we go to court. You stand on one side yeah, and one, yes. somebody else stands on the other side. So, yes. so let me finish. Then you can tell me what uh, your, your thinking is. So I'm saying that over the years, former president himself agrees that we have been paying that. The committee acknowledges that. Mm -hmm. Okay? That, look, we know the work that they are doing. 
there is no uh, provision oh, in no the constitution for us to do this. There is no uh, legislative uh, piece of, I mean, a piece of legislation that we can also fall on to give this anyway. But over the years, it has been paid anyway. Then they go ahead to say that, look, let us institutionalize it. Okay? For me, I have no uh, problem with the verdict, the, the general verdict that has been given, that it is illegal. Because once you weigh it against the law, mm -hmm. that is an illegality. You cannot run away from it. Good. Okay. You, you understand my I point? I get you. Yes. But uh, the, that, that becomes the legal form. But the substance of it is that over the years we have been giving them the money. And then I think he also made a case that uh, it is going to be used retroactively 2017 to 2021 solely for uh, the, the two. two of them. I don't think so. I don't think so. This one, if it is done for Article 71 people, if, if we are even, if they are even seen as Article 71 people, my friend knows that when we come to Parliament, that's why the salaries they give us, is say, they say that it's on account, because it has not been determined. So now, at the now that it is being determined, uh, by the time they finish, these people would have got some, uh, I mean, the current parliament mm -hmm. would have got some kind of back pay mm -hmm. to be paid to them. And it has always happened. I think that this practice should stop and then we can do it prospectively. So that when you are going in there, you know how much you're going to take. And at the end of it, you are not expecting that you have some back pay to be given you. Over the years, that has been the problem. His call for the establishment of independent emolument commission, mm. I think it's fair. Because uh, you, you, you realize that uh, the thing itself is in there, but the way it is couched in the constitution itself, it appears to me that every president that comes should appoint. Should appoint. That's, I mean, the constitution mm -hmm. seems to be. But I think that, uh, like Justice Taylor said in To Find Attorney General, the constitution is a living document. Uh, document. And so we must let it live yeah. to suit the exigencies uh, of, of the time. Do, yeah. And so if we think that the way to go is that we have independent emolument uh, 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 commission, or whatever. so be it. Right? The issue about whether um, uh, w w whether asset declarations should uh, 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 be included or expanded uh, or extended to include spouses yeah. and all those kind of things. And those arguments that happened in the past, uh, those things are, I think, a ruse in this. It's just to score political points. They were unnecessary. Mm -hmm. He shouldn't have brought those ones at all. Let's just, just discuss the issue the way it is. But if you try to pitch yourself against the certain president, and especially when we know your intentions, you are trying to make a conversation which ordinarily should not have hey, any which political intentions do you know? Come again. Which intentions do you know? The intentions that NDC has already put across. That's Please, it. don't don't be all straight <laughs> about this. <laughs> Look at, right. you, have to, you have two minutes. Yes. So 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 I think that uh, that area where he tries to pitch himself and says that oh I'm the better person and uh, the, the 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 man who is in the uh, he, well he, that, 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 that's, that's to be expected they're a political rival so like we can understand oh, that. the point is that look sometimes we should leave politi politics out of it and discuss these issues of national importance as uh, I mean devoid of. Partisanship as possible. That is the ultimate game. You yeah. say you disagree with his legal interpretation. Of course, of course. I mean, wait. salary, you see, salary is a term of art. No, no. Mm -hmm. When the position itself has defined wait, it, you wait, are talking wait. about salary, salary term let of let have been defined mm -hmm. to include. Do you get it? Mm -hmm. So, yes, there is salary, and it includes A, B, C, D, E, F. You understand? So you can be receiving an. He's only saying that whoever is receiving, uh, receiving a salary, that salary will be defined to include all the perks of office that you are enjoying. No, 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 no. no. But are... when the person is not on salary, eh, mm -hmm. people can get like stipends, eh? mm -hmm. it is not salary. And they are mm -hmm. saying that they give them some uh, quarterly stipends. Mm -hmm. It's not salary. So in this case, it cannot. 
Be a chaplain. No, no, no. Talking about you. A Jews down there generates. Oh, yes, I am. Yes, but interpretation. You see, yes, yes. So that in in so you see, for instance, when you go into the tax laws, you know that now allowances are taxed. You you understand. So that is where I'm coming from. That there is a salary, and that salary. So, include so allowance the is salary. No, that's yeah, fine. You salary, have, uh, yeah, it's not salary. No, but the point right. is that that's point what is the made. Point is, is made. Saying. point is made on that. Franklin, are you with us? I'm here. Um, yes. Franklin, you can wrap up on this whole conversation and then we can go to a draw. Well, interesting conversation so far. I guess that uh, we've been given for that to chew on uh, as long as it concerns the, the, rule, the, 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 the rulers of the land. Um, what is interesting in all these conversations are that it looks as if once we have an opportunity to expand the realms of, you know, appropriations for the for the for the for those who uh, organize our lives for us, uh, it appears as if there's no end in sight. I recall that this same committee, I think, reported uh, that when they contacted MPs about the Speaker of Parliament's uh, monument, I suspect. Um, the MPs were worried that uh, even though the Speaker of Parliament is entitled to uh, what's it called, uh, seek medical attention abroad and reviews occasionally abroad, the MPs were rather concerned that they wanted to know the number of people who would accompany the Speaker of Parliament. <laughs> now, um, that's, that, that tells you that when Dr. Santi then begins to ask the question, why would Parliament not even look at this matter and decide to actually pass it on and further prove it? Uh, the answer actually lies in the fact that they are very much interested in the expansion of the affairs of those who govern us rather than the affairs of us who really matter. So when this co the conversation about the uh, payments of uh, salaries or spouses came up, Initially, of course, I was under the. Uh, I'm, I'm still under the assumption that, look, this conversation should not be seen as a sexist one. It should not be sentimental, uh, because of the fact that these spouses actually do some work. And in fact, if they had not been working, if they were not uh, first and second ladies, they would have been doing their own work anyway. So, I am on the under the assumption that once we have decided that we want to make them paid public servants, then we have to define exactly what they do. Because if you just leave it at the point that they should be paid salaries uh, to the equivalent of what cabinet ministers receive, the last I know of is that cabinet ministers have defined roles they perform, right? Mm -hmm. So we need specific duties assigned to them. That is when we can begin to exact accountability as to whether they have uh, they have performed such duties and for which they'll be receiving salaries. So when we say that it should be legalized, because as it is now, it's not legalized, I think we need to go a step further to say that, look, beyond just saying they should be paid, I don't think they themselves will be happy they are going to be told to be receiving salaries just because they are spouses. I suspect they would have said, okay, well, um, I suspect we should be saying, and maybe that's what the committee should have added, that look, if we are recommending so-so and so, apart from making it legal, we should also define exactly what rules they'll be performing. Because as it is now, they do perform some other functions, by the way, for which they raise money through the state. I say through the state because had they not become spouses of the first and second gentlemen, there's no way no, anybody will be giving them money to run their foundations and they would. You notice these foundations die immediately, they, they are no more in office. Yeah. Mm. So, so that is why we need to be sure that whatever rules we are assigning to them uh, must be clearly you know, uh, uh, laid out. Otherwise, uh, it will become something like uh, simply because they are spouses. But having said all of that, um, I'll go back to the first point I was making, that it's interesting how we are beginning to expand the largesse for public office holders. It looks as if there's no end in sight. 
which is why we need to stop at one point and ask ourselves, is this the way we want to organize this society called, uh, well, a society called Ghana and a democracy called Ghana? Essentially, the point I'm making is, what value are we getting in return when we do these things? You know, I had a funny comment this morning from another network that said, well, if the spouses want to work um, and receive salaries, then they should be put under NAPCO and uh, a few other entities. <laughs> <laughs> because, but you see, it goes back to the point that at least NAPCO people know what they are doing and they are being paid a salary. So we should know what they are doing, give them specific rules, and actually define whether those rules are, are going to add value to the economy. Um, that is what I think we should be, we should also demand in, in this conversation. All right, and thank you, Franklin. And uh, we'll end this conversation on that note so that we can uh, move on quickly to Adria, where the public inquiry uh, instituted by the president through the Interior Ministry is hearing uh, testimony from persons to try and uh, make sense of what happened in uh, Ejra uh, that led to the shooting of shooting and killing of two persons by the military and also six persons being injured. We heard recently that one has had a, a leg amputated. A 16-year-old boy has had the leg amputated uh, based on that. So uh, quite a few people have appeared, and uh, one of them was the Asante General Minister who defended the military involvement in the tensions in Ejra. Uh, we've also heard from the military commanders on the ground, from the police commander on the ground, we've heard from the MC. So we'll just do a quick recap of some of the testimony that we have heard, and then we come in the studio and uh, break down the work of the committee, because there, there has also been criticism of the committee's work in terms of its posture and what it is trying to achieve with uh, the work, particularly for those who have observed the work of previous uh, commissions of inquiry. They feel that uh, this particular one is a bit worrisome. In fact, uh, we've had a statement from the family of uh, the gentleman whose death led to the protest, Ibrahim uh, Mohammed Kaka, who are saying, they will not appear because they feel that uh, the committee's uh, line of questioning is a bit uh, worrisome for them. It looks like they've already made up their mind. There have also been attacks on the media and the role they played in it. You know, quite a few people have had a few comments to make. So uh, you can also share your thoughts with us, but we'll do a quick playback and then when we come back, we'll hear from Kujua Sante on this particular matter and then from our guests in studio as well. The three member committee of inquiry led by an appeals court judge, His Lordship Justice George Kingsley Kumsin began its official sitting on the Edra incident few minutes after 10 a.m. on Tuesday. The first witness to appear before it was the Ashanti Regional Minister Simon Osei Mensa, who doubles as the head of the Regional Security Council. The minister spent time justifying why he deployed the military to Edra during a protest by some indigents of the area. The people have decided to go and burn the police station, houses in which some two accused persons had been arrested by the police and also caused damage to other properties in the ground. Honorable, once again, can I find out that you talked about an, some accused persons or let the suspects have been arrested by the police? Two people. What were they suspected to have done? Was it the killing of the man or causing trumping? It was alleged that they might have clubbed Kaka for which it resulted to his death. So it was in, the, in relation to Kaka's clubbing and consequent subsequent death. You may continue. So when I heard the intelligence on 29th June 2021, I requested Lieutenant Kenel Kepra to again send some personnel to go and support 
the police. Just as that settled, the minister tended in a video clip as part of his evidence in testifying to the committee. There was, however, a back and forth between the minister and members of the committee to allow the source of the video to appear and testify. Certain parts of the incident that happened in Nigeria. Can you tell the committee the source of this video? Um, some of the people who were giving me the intelligence, they sent the videos to me. And as, as I've said earlier, I can't divulge the source. Thank you. Can you help us get the person who did the recording of the video to come and testify? Oh, it will be very difficult because tomorrow they won't give me. It will be very difficult because tomorrow I'm afraid people will not be willing to give me information. Uh, Honorable, we want to assure you that if the person is willing to come, we will hear his evidence in camera and uh, his identity will not be disclosed. Distinguished members of the committee take that the source is Simon or Semenza. What I said is that take it that you got the video from Simon Osei Mensa. Next to appear before the committee was Erastus Asaridonko, a journalist with the Multimedia Group Limited. As a journalist who covered the protest for the Multimedia Group on that day, Mr. Asaridonko was before the committee to give an account and also help with evidence. My Lord, we saw four armed military men in uniform, step out of the military pickup. First saw one following uh, with the inscription Operation COVID. That's the same pickup, my lord. So four armed military men stepped out of the pickup and then formed a line and started firing into the air. Firing was into the air? Yes, my lord. The firing, my lord, went on for about a minute into the air. And then the firing seemed to be coming down, being lowered. Can you, can you explain that or can you demonstrate that? Into the air, then which angle again? So initially, we saw them when they stepped out of the vehicle, they started shooting at this range. Then it came. He later tended in a number of video clips as evidence, but was questioned by the committee on why his media house chose to use a caption that linked the late social activist to the hashtag Fix the Country campaign. My worry is that, uh, you know, Joy carries a lot of weight in terms of the news they put out there. It has a lot of weight. A lot of people listen to Joy or the multimedia group and they get convinced about whatever they see or hear from multimedia. My worry is why if you people were not so certain about the fact that the man was a member of uh, Fix the country campaign group. Why do you put that hashtag? Yes, it is true that the man has been killed. It can be for any other reason. So that, those were, uh, that was a playback of uh, some of the witnesses who appeared before the Jaguar Committee. And I've been joined by two other guests. Uh, so my MPs, please give me a bit of space to work. Uh, Dr. Jones Opoku is a criminologist. He is joined us via Zoom. And Dr. Sule Ibrahim is a security analyst. He's also joined us via Zoom. And I, I guess I will begin with Dr. Opoku Dr. Opoku good morning. Good morning to you, Zinia <laughs> Good morning, Senior Opoku and welcome to the big issue. I, I, I guess the question I will ask is if you've been, obser you've, you've, uh, been observing the testimony, what have you made of 
the first week of the committee's work. Okay, all right. Thank you so much, and a very good morning to your viewers and your listeners, and also to my co-panelists. Um, I must be honest, I've not been able to follow each of the testimonies uh, that has been given uh, at the commission, but I've listened to some of them, snipers, especially the first few days. And uh, I think, uh, from my perspective, um, it is so far so good. Just that looking at and listening to some of the accounts, especially from uh, the security people and the, the regional minister, who I presume is supposed to be the head of the RECSEC, um, I find a lot of um, inconsistencies relating to certain operational procedures uh, in terms of uh, command and control in how some of these operations are supposed to be, to be carried out. And for me, these are the things that we have to look at as a country. And for me, these are the things I want to talk about when I'm, when I'm going, without actually preempting or prejudicing the, the outcome of, of, of the commission's uh, report. But I think that some of the issues that have played out so far in terms of the commentary, especially from the security point of view, uh, are things that uh, we have to look at and as a country we have to work on. What has caught your attention in that regard? Let's, let's just begin from there, from the okay. security point of view. Okay, so if, you, if you're really listening to what the regional minister said and also what the uh, police commander within the area and also the, the military people say, you can see that there was some form of uh, confusion in terms of, of the operations and in terms of who should give what kind of uh, instruction and for what is supposed to be, to, be, to, be, to be issued out. And for me, that is, that is quite worrying. And as I said, you see, I've said over the years and in many of my, my, my lectures, I tell people that, look, when it comes to civil engagement, okay, especially when you have to deal with the civilians, it is always appropriate that uh, we leave much of the work to the police especially in terms of the structure, the command and control. It is better we leave most of them to the police. In that case, we can be able to demand a lot of accountability from them because they are supposed to interact more with their citizens as opposed to the military. And now the way we continue to militarize and also try to you know, involve the military in some of this civil engagement, I, I presume, is what is creating some of these, these kind of problems in terms of the command and control structures that normally happen. And if you listen very carefully to the the the, the, the you know the, the commentary from the from the soldier, you know, from them they were called in to come as a as a form of reinforcement. And you and I know very well that once the, the military is involved in such operations, you know, the, the word reinforcement means two different things to the police and also to the military. And so if you look at the, the commentary and the kind of testimony he gave, he tells you that, look, once these guys called us to come in, we have to come and eliminate whatever threat that was there. Because the, the structure and the configuration of the military is such that they are not supposed to be engaging civilians in the way we, we involve them in this country. So most of the time, if you should go do a historical analysis of the kind of military civil engagements we have, you will see that most of the time, there are always casualties at the end. You know, from 2018, you can see, and even if we should go way back and we should do a historical analysis of the military involvement in such civil engagement, you will see that always there is some form of casualties at the end. And I mean, recently, you could see when the military was brought in in Techima, you could see how the military acted. Even during the COVID, you will find more videos and evidences of how the military had a lot of run up with uh, civilians, as opposed to how the police had that kind of engagement with us during the COVID time and during the lockdown. So what, for me, is most important that we must begin to revise the kind of operational strategies we deploy between the civilians and, and the police, especially when these kind of issues come up. Look, uh, Senior Kutu, you know, in, milit in, in, in policing, okay, there is what we call guardian and warrior approaches. Okay, and our guardian and warrior approach basically means that, you see, the police, based on how they relate to the civilians, see the civilians as either partners or as enemies. So when they see us as partners, 
they are going to employ what we call the guardian approach. And now the guardian approach is basically to protect life and property. And if they see the civilians as enemies, then they are going to use what we call the warrior approach. And most of the time, depending on the kind of scenario they are confronted with, depending on the kind of violent you know, confrontations that they are, they are confronted with, they, they bring these kind of policing approaches to bear. And it is based on that that they deploy what we call the de-escalation strategies that, that they have. And if you see how that works out, most of the time, the police, by their presence, act as deterrent to the mob or to the crowd, more as opposed to the military, when who are most, mostly seen as combative in their in their configuration. So for me, basically, these are the things that I think we have to we have to really work on as a country. And if we don't do that, and we have to continually involve the military in such kind of operations, trust me, we will always come back every day and we are going to have casualties at the end. Now, in Dr. Pokwa, in listening to the army commander when he showed up and him yeah. describing the information they had and what they set out to do, did it tally with your general understanding of how they are supposed to act in such a situation? Okay, yes. Basically, I wouldn't fault the military. I mean, because as I said, by the architecture and their configuration, that's how they are supposed to act. You know, they are not into the way they are configured. They are not into this kind of, you know, civil resolution of issues. Okay, they, so I tell people that, look, they, they come to assault and not to resolve. And now when they come in, their, their, their motive and their operational strategy is to quell any kind of threat. So if you tell them that they should come for reinforcement, what that means is that whoever is there earlier on has been overwhelmed by whatever threat that exists. And so by the narration of the military, you can't, you can't actually fall them because based on the information that was taken to them, for them to come, it was that there was a threat and that the police had been overpowered. And so whatever threat that is overpowering the police, by their compactive architecture, they are supposed to come and quell that threat. That is why when you, when you see the videos and the way they, they, they acted. You see that immediately they got out of the car, they were in combat posture, and they have to move straight into action. So based on the analysis and the kind of commentary they have given, the, the military people have given, actually, they didn't, they, I, I don't see them as having fought it because of the kind of, uh, you know, architecture and configuration they are and the kind of information that they gave to them to come and act on. Let me deal with uh, Dr. Sule uh, Ibrahim as well. Dr. Ibrahim, morning. Dr. Dr. Ibrahim, unmute your microphone. Okay. Uh, good morning to you and good morning to everyone. Thank you very much as well for finding time. I'm sure you heard Dr. Pokuari and his assessment of uh, the testimony yeah. that he has heard. What have you made of the testimonies of the, secu of the people in charge of security this week? Because we've heard from the regional minister, we've heard from the MC, we've heard from uh, the, so the, 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 the soldiers as well. What did you make of yeah. their testimony? Thank you. If you look at the whole problem from one, some of us started arguing that this, there are three compartments to this issue, that we look at the deployment, and then we look at the operation, and we look at the fatal outcomes that will, um, have been reported. The whole thing bothers over the decision to deploy. So if your decision to deploy is already flawed, definitely the operation will be flawed, and you have a lot of um, penalties at the end. And right through the, the, there was admission that was based on mistaken as zone. And I was expecting the committee to probe further on that one. What informed that uh, uh, mistaken assumption? Because it, it, it borders intelligence, poor assessments of the threat. And then that poor assessment, it can be informed by all your own searching or attitude rather than the facts on the ground. Because if you look at some of the commentaries or the, 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 those who appeared, um, the Chanty Regional um, Deputy Police Commander and the other from the security angle, there was indication that from between 27, 28, 29, there were ample evidence that things were not good on the ground. And, and, and the fact that they had other um, officers coming to support them. Uh, the middle of the night, to the day of the actual barrier, they have to dis dismiss or let those forces go. That's a, a question that we need to probe because I don't know if the main event will take place in the next day, you will set your forces free. You will need to have them there. So 
what at all informed the assessments of the threat? Who came up with the idea or who brought the information? And what's the relationship between that person and the threat? So we need, that angle has not been explored. And they quickly shifted the debate to the operation and fate outcome. And we leave the deployment area. The decision to deploy based on the intelligence available and the based on the poor assessment of intelligence. If you don't explore that angle and then we come out of with some ideas to build from there, you end up repeating some of these things in the future. Someone deployed, called for military unilaterally, and, and the person said, I cannot produce my source. And we have no way of certifying ourselves that the videos presented are act were actually taken from uh, um, the Ejra events. And we have no way of uh, verifying whether um, he got the intelligence um, some hours to the event taking place, and there's no date, there's no time, and we cannot also compel him to produce documents to justify or let us know these are the, 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 the exigencies of the time. That is why I have to act unilaterally without necessarily even saying, okay, I'm not in the Ashanta region, so I have this message, and I'll forward it to uh, um, the regional command of the police to ask them, okay, can you take action on this? And the police will then see what they will act from there. But if you just receive information and say I'm the head of um, the, the security council of the region, and for that matter, action can take place, you end up creating this kind of problem. And that is where the problem is. I wish the committee could say stay much longer with the deployment phase, because as for the operational uh, gaps and lapses, you already know the consequences that have come from there. Because once you bring the military, they want to activate their principle of shoot kill or whatever. But even that principle is being doubted in, in, in many of recent debates about insurgency, uh, uh, military control of insurgency, or even um, civilian military relation literature. Those things are being questioned. You can't go to go and handle civilians just as you handle a combatant enemy in a war zone. And if you look at the Geneva principles, um, uh, the, the additional protocol to one rather, if you look at the five principles, that states what the, the, the participation of the military is necessary. That's the question. If it's necessary, it has to be necessitated by the, the information that we have. And that's uh, what's the name? The intelligence from the deployment phase. So if the intelligence is poor, we cannot establish that whether they were necessary. And the kind of suffering that civilians were subject to wasn't necessary. And we all agree that it wasn't necessary. Where the, the, the proportionality of the power they use, that's also a problem that we all debate. We are all debating. And so the problem is not necessarily in the operation or in the, um, the Twitter outcomes, let's say the deaths, the injuries, and as, um, expenditure to investigate all this, but in the operational, uh, the deployment phase. And I think if the committee will help the country to deal with how we replace mm. intelligence, how we manage intelligence, I think they will have to go on that angle going forward. Thank, th thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Sule Ibrahim. And uh, I will use that point you made to uh, lead my questioning with Dr. Asante. Dr. Asante, you are still with us, I hope. Yes, I am. Yes, and it's interesting that uh, Dr. Ibrahim and Dr. Pokwa have all spoken about the command and control. And I like Dr. Ibrahim's point about investigating further the deployment phase, but we seem to have skipped that bit now. And I want to ask you about the criticisms of the committee and how they have conducted themselves at the line of questioning so far. Fair or unfair, based on what you have watched? Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, good morning to my... Uh... Uh, other panelists, I'm kind of meeting them for the first time. So um, I'm going to be very cautious and deliberate with my comments on this because I still feel that it is important that this committee works and get this right because there is a lot riding on how this matter is dealt with. In Edra. It's happening in Edra, but there's a lot of people watching. The the army has been uh, in the news for the wrong reasons. Uh, 
in the last couple of months, I think that, you know, throughout the election and, and then post after that. And I think that is worrying. Um, it is added to the the perceptions and, and, and worries about internal security issues. And um, it's, you know, the, the, the committee must be able to do an effective job. I think that mistakes have been made in the first week or so of this committee sitting. And I don't know whether it is, um, maybe they didn't have enough time to prepare and to reflect on the way they were going to approach uh, this fact-finding exercise. Because after all, it is a fact-finding exercise, you know. But some of the the exchanges I've had uh, seem to have departed from the process of fact-finding into processes of uh, opinion, offering, and conclusions being drawn, even for matters that uh, were not even part of the, the lines of inquiry and were just introduced. So I am hoping that in the second phase or the second week of this work, the committee would try to redeem itself. And I'll come back to how I think it's, a, it's essential that they, or how they can do that. But yes, I have been a bit uncomfortable with uh, the way it's proceeded. And unfortunately, it has caught some very bad uh, reactions from the public you know, on the committee. I, and I'll give you one example. The issue around the whole media uh, question. So the suggestion came from a police officer who suggested that the action by residents of Edra was made worse, uh, and this I'm just paraphrasing, was made worse by media coverage of the event. All right. Now, certainly that is possible, but the committee did not even go further to interrogate this theory that uh, this police officer had and said, you know, oh, can you uh, explain to us how you come to this conclusion. One of the things he, he offered was that, oh, the, the police, the regional police actually issued a statement, but even the statement was not circulated. But the media just went about to do its own work, which you would expect media to do. The fact that a police officer or a police institution has issued a statement that is not conclusive evidence of what is transpiring. Media will go out there and interrogate what is going on before they put out any information. But that was not pursued. Rather, the committee went on to, first of all, agree with him, and to even suggest that he shouldn't even mind the media because, you know, the media just have a pension for, for doing this kind of thing. And then it just degenerated into all kinds of conclusions and opinions, and I think that was very unhelpful. So that, that really left, I think, a bad taste in the, in, the, uh, in the mouths of people. And it's not helped with the image of, of the committee. But as I said, for me, the committee has an, an important job. What my, my initial uh, previous panelists have said, there are so many gaps in just the interrogation of, of these things. But it, just, it, it, it means that the committee itself has to have a good command of the, not command, maybe just a good overview of the SOPs for both the, the, the police and the, uh, and the army. So that when people are, are recounting the steps that they took, you can find a basis to question further whether or not they were acting consistent with you know, the, the rules or not. So I think that uh, there are gaps there and um, that has to be pursued because otherwise it will be very, very difficult to come to uh, a decision as to who is to blame for what action and which is going to help us determine who is at fault and what kinds of sanctions that have to be applied. Because if, if it comes to the point where you cannot establish those things, it becomes very difficult you know, to bring this to a satisfac satisfactory 
conclusion. And that's what I worry about. But as I said, I hope that the weekend will give the committee an opportunity to redeem itself. And one of the ways I think they should do that is to reach out to the family of uh, Ibrahim Mohammed, uh, uh, also known as Kaka, and try to get them to rescind their decision not to participate and to assure them, give them the assurances that is needed just to bring back public confidence in, in the committee's work. But uh, so far, um, as I said, mistakes have been made, and there's still room and opportunity to try to address it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Asante. Mr. Lo, you've been, I'm sure you've been following <laughs> this uh, address situation right up to the testimonies that have been given this week. W what are your sentiments on the work that the inquiry well, has done so far? Well, my first reaction is that we are in real trouble Why? As, a, as a nation because of certain things that has been said and has been done. I'll start with Ashanti Regional Minister, my very good friend, Simon uh, Osei Mensa. Very, very good friend, friend of mine, you know, and we served on public accounts committee together. So. I was a member of the district assembly. I was in charge of justice and security. So I served on DISEC. In taking a decision of this nature, he didn't even call a DISEC meeting. He said he didn't have time. There's nothing about time about it. Looking at the time he said he received his report, at least he could have called the security chiefs in the area before a decision is taken as to what to do. That is the proper thing to do. That's number one. Number two, from the way he said it, because we are in big, 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 big trouble. Hey, why? He says what? So I got intel, and then I called a certain lieutenant colonel, and I instructed him to take move troops to Edra. Hey, if every um, uh, every regional minister wants to be calling people at his whim and caprice to go to uh, somewhere because he's received intel that there's trouble, then the military command structure is broken down. At least I lived with the, close to the military because I know what goes into moving troops in the past. I don't believe that's changed much. So for him to say, I called a certain lieutenant colonel and I said, uh, there's, uh, I hear there's trouble in the drawer, so move your boys there. For me, it smacks of trouble because then the military is, deployment is now at the ship and caprice of, of, politicians. of uh, politicians. And it is a very, very, very dangerous development. That is number one. Mm -hmm. Very, very dangerous. Number two, if you listen to the original minister, already he was prejudiced against Ejra because in his testimony, he starts talking about uh, every election where a dry is marked as a, uh, as a hot spot. And uh, any time they... But that's fact. Oh. But you see, what I'm saying is that, was, was it the reason why he quickly asked the military to go join the police there? And what instructions went with it? Because if you think that this is a hot spot, so you have heard that something is happening there. You see, look at the thought process and see how the deployment went. So clearly... And, and the security uh, 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 person you spoke to made a very, very, very serious issue. We've seen the video. Mm. But that video came, started circulating several hours after the people had been killed. Mm. So was the video taken before or at, uh, when the incident started and therefore that was the basis for which he deployed the military? Or that it was after the people got angry when they learned that some people had died? And they started mm. get so you see really. And by this, you are making reference to the video that allegedly shows an attack Good. on the Black Maria. Yes, yeah. Which led to his decision his dec to bring yes. in reinforcement. But really, really, at what point did that happen? But you see, this is a situation where they are saying that they received intel from the 29th. Mm. So really, the intel has been in the system. He had enough time to call a DITEC meeting. He has enough time to to send people on the ground even before deployment is done. And therefore, all the issues that they, they talk about, for me, doesn't add up. The only one that seems to have some credibility is the deputy police commander. He admits that, look, we went there ill-prepared. And that when we got there, we were overwhelmed with the situation. It tells you that there was really no collaboration within the security apparatus. <coughs> and he is not the Ejura police commander. He is the deputy regional police commander. 
So at the level of even the region, what security went on and what kinds of uh, a, a decision making process went on. So I agree with those who say that look, there was total breakdown of the uh, command and that people did things haphazardly. In other jurisdictions, the regional minister should not be sitting at his desk. Right now? Yes. Because clearly he failed in his duty. He failed in his duty and everything now can be put at his doorstep <clears> because look, once he got it wrong, Everybody else is going yes, to get it wrong. a chain of issues uh, 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 went on. But because of time, let me just quickly also come to the fact that me, I believe that Kaka's family were spot on when they decided not to cooperate with the committee or even come appear before them. Well, now, the question is very basic. Why was the committee set up? Why was the committee set up? The committee was set up to find out what events led to the shooting of those people. The protesters. Therefore, Kaka <laughs> is dead. Investigation is going on. People have been uh, arrested. Uh, arrested. So why do they want to talk about those things? They have no business in that area. Because if the matter is before court, mm -hmm. and then you are now coming, bringing them to a public inquiry, the things they come to say, are they not going to prejudice the matter before the court? An investigation that is going ongoing. They should stick. Yes, we agree that after Kaka was buried, it was from there that, as it were, things escalated. Yes, things escalated, and it was then that the police came in and the military were, were called in, and these things happened. So I think that the committee should stay within its confines if they want to do a good job. And I don't know what questions they can ask the family to tell. Well, what was it the family can to tell them? How Kaka died? It has nothing to do with what they are supposed to be investigating. Mm. At all. It has nothing to do with what they are, they are supposed to be investigating, how things went wrong after the burial of Kaka. Which perhaps speaks to Dr. Asante's concerns that the committee looked a bit ill-prepared during week one Yes, for their job in front of them. Yes. And you see, again, there's so much inconsistency so far for with everybody who came to, who, who came to speak. For instance, and even when they questioned uh, uh, Asari Donko, the Joy FM uh, regional Erastus. Erastus, that kind of questions for me was not necessary. Why? If they said that Kaka was su suspected to be part of the fix the, uh, 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 fix the country, uh, country. How, how, how does that feed into what we are investigating? How, I mean, how does that fit into? We were looking easy, like you are saying. It's a fact-finding committee. Mm -hmm. What happened on that day? How did it happen? Why did it happen? Who were involved? Some mundane uh, uh, issues about how some uh, this thing was captioned does not go into the cracks of the matter. We are dis because if nobody had died, we are not going to institute a, 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 public, inquiry. a public inquiry. Where are we going to is it the, 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 there was a crowd and then it was dispersed and everybody went home. Was anybody going to call for him? It is because people have died as a result of indecision. You know, that is why, or other indecision or that a, a decision that was not properly taken. That is why we are asking that find out the facts hmm. that led to the death of these people. Okay. Simplicita. Okay, simplicita and for me. Franklin. Well, interesting conversations again. I thought that the committee's work was done. Uh, immediately, the Asante Regional Minister said, well, he gave the command. You, you think so? It should have ended there? That's it. Why? I thought that, well, I mean, that, isn't that what we are looking for? Who gave the order? Is that not what we are supposed to be looking out for? That uh, what led to this constant the disturbances and the killings? Well, and he provided some video evidence to show that people were, uh, I mean, the police was getting overwhelmed. And so as a result of that, he felt in his right to give an order for that to happen. Of course, we've questioned whether he was, he was even right to give the order in the first place. Um, so I thought the work is, is, is done. I'm, are we trying to find out why, what the people ate before they went over the street? <laughs> or, 
what motivated them to run after the police? Uh, what's it called? What vehicle was that again? Black uh, Maya. Yeah. Or uh, what type of attack did they wear? What motivated them to come onto the street? I don't know. I mean, I'm just asking you. Do you think that is that not what we are supposed to be finding out? Well, I'm not answering questions today, so. Well, I'm asking you. <laughs> what is the what's the remit of the committee? Well, certainly, so, yes. Yeah, we are supposed to, to probe into the circumstances that led to that. Yeah, if it was an if it was if it if the if the demonstrations or the, 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 the for lack of a better word, the riotous crowd um have not been dispersed with live ammunition and some people killed and maimed, would we be having the committee sitting? Somebody gave her the order and the person has identified himself. I think the matter ends there. Okay. Since the matter has ended there for you, let me take a quick break and then uh Mr. Aban will wrap up the big issue for us. We have just 10 minutes to go. We'll be right back. Are you ready? Yes. Office time, sorry. Mommy, hold it. Why you feel like that? I hold it. You know, you feel my time. I hold it. Office time, I'm sorry. Oh, 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 Get your share of the Bet Planet Mega Prize Pool. More chances to win Super Six. A football race and an extra boost on your winnings are waiting for you at Bet Planet. I always love you. For the best odds, biggest wins, and fastest payouts, choose Bet Planet. This advert has been vetted and approved by the Gaming Commission of Ghana. Bet responsibly, not for persons below the age of 18. No, I cheer for Safran. Let me go swear I won't call you. As a picture, see it clear. A far time better. As an other tennis, there could be your home. So, what a man's time when I'm away. Oh, what a picture! What a picture! What do AD plus the coda or multi TV and now natural land agent? Natural local channels now. Oh, eight demo. The hands of the star eight seven nine hash numbers from Kubu box. And now the advocate eight channels. You can get an HD blast decoder from now till the 9th of August for just 89.99 Ghana CDs and enjoy three months free subscription. Enjoy all the excitement and life sports action in the HD Plus Air Bustle Feeling Feeling Promo. Promo lasts from 7 June to 9th August 2021. Visit hd-plus.com.gh or call 024 243 9872 for more info. What you you Half a nose for good things. <laughs> Welcome back, it's the final head of the big issue. Uh, Mr. Aban, I'll give you final comments. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let us, I mean, let me first uh, register my condolences to the bereaved family. Uh, families. Families, yes, of those who died. I mean, from Macho Kaka himself and later the two, oh, and then right. of course, those who have been injured in the course of this. Uh, it's needless, we don't have to see this. But I think that in interrogating this, we must know the real terms of reference given to the committee. The committee is supposed to uh, be a fact-finding committee to guide our future in the dispersing crowd and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my little advice to them. They should not create a posture where 
people would lose confidence in them. Uh, it must not be inquisit I mean, uh, like an inquisition. Uh, they must give free. I think one of the ways they could have done this was to get a council who would be asking all the questions, and then they would be following. And if there is a need for a few clarifications here and there, they do it. I have not followed their. Uh, public inquiry, but it appears to me that there's a lot of public backlash against the way they are going about it. They have another week to make amends so that people will have confidence in it. Otherwise, um, once the committee's work is already, uh, uh, I mean, uh, already rejected by the, public, uh, by the public view, it means that whatever decision by way of quiet people that may come as a result of it, may not even uh, give any confidence at all. The purpose of this is to make sure that we get the real facts, be guided by it. But I associate myself wholly with the comments that um, my friend made initially, that if the regional minister um, can easily call the uh, military and deploy them, uh, I don't think it's, it's, it's correct. I believe that, yes, we will have a regional, uh, uh, I mean, military command for the northern sector and all those kind of things. But uh, there must be proper chain of command within the military so that we know who has ordered what. Yes, you may request that this and this and this is the case. So they, on the basis of their own professional expertise, would assess to see whether it is necessary for mm. the military to be deployed. Kind of like or, a checklist. Exactly. Otherwise, uh, we, before we realize, we, we would also annex the uh, military into uh, political partisanship and all those kind of things. So that, that would be my, my, my comment. I don't want to go too much into it. All right, then. And that will be the comments upon which we end the show. I'll just, just take a few more comments. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, it's been quite the morning on the big issue. Uh, this is an interesting one. He says, the Albert from Spintech says, the true problem of our country is our constitution and the structure and roles of how leaders are appointed to manage our spaces. Mm. I don't get the argument of the MPs that they are the problem themselves. We claim we are pressing the separation of powers here. The executive arm has great influence on them all. The constitution is not fit for its current purpose. Well, that is an interesting conversation. Uh, Felix from Chema Community he says, looks like from the conversation, parliamentarians are building their case in comparison to the other arms of government. My brother, now our uh, so-called democracy is based on each man for himself. Politicians are the same. They're in agreement when it's mutual and convenient and opposition <laughs> makes noise when it goes against them. I must say I'm very disappointed and outraged at both sides. God save us. As for our first and second ladies, the least said, the better. Have a great day. Abraham Sin in, in Krakan says, the ordinary Ghanaians is not part of the MPP's plan, so uh, things are falling apart. Teachers are teaching without textbooks in our basic schools. Common laptops to help facilitate our teaching. We do not even get it. Uh, so these are some of the uh, thoughts that have come through. Uh, thank you very much for spending time with us again on another weekend. A big thank you to George Lowe and uh, former Member of Parliament for North Dai and Alexander Aban, former Member of Parliament for Gumas, for spending your morning with us. It's never easy. A uh, big thank you as well to Senior Dr. Joseph Boko, a criminologist, and then Dr. Sule Ibrahim, a security analyst, who also joined us in the final part of the show. Dr. Kujo Pumpunia Sanche, Director of Advocacy and Policy, CDD Ghana. A big thank you as well. And Franklin Kujo, President of Imani Africa. Have a good weekend. Thank you.